He is a Hall of Famer who averaged seven points per game. During his career, he was an alcoholic, womanizer, a tireless party animal, and one of the best defenders and rebounders in NBA history. He's a tattooed lunatic and a shy good guy in one. All that and much more is Dennis Rodman, one of the most complex and interesting people in NBA history. In this video, we'll discuss the curious case of Dennis Rodman, how good he was actually, and the impact he had on his teams and the NBA in general. Early Life and Career Rodman's whole life is anything but ordinary, and his path to becoming an NBA player was different than any other player in history. He was relatively short in high school, standing at 5'11", he didn't make the varsity team, and was completely irrelevant in the eyes of college scouts. His father left the family when Dennis was three, and his mother worked tirelessly to provide for her two daughters and Dennis, who was a completely lost cause by his own admission. I wandered aimlessly on the streets of Dallas. I didn't know what I wanted. I had no interest in school, and nobody was interested in me and my game. Somewhat unbelievably, Rodman experienced a sudden growth spurt between the age of 19 and 20 and grew over 7 inches to his current height of 6'7". But other than playing basketball on the playgrounds, Rodman never played organized basketball in his life and was stuck drifting from one odd job to another. When he was working as a janitor in the Dallas International Airport, he got arrested for stealing 15 watches from the airport gift shop, after which his mother kicked him out of the house. He would probably end up dead or in jail if it weren't for Lonnie Reisman, a coach at the small University of Southeastern Oklahoma State in the NAIA division, who offered Rodman a scholarship after seeing him play in a junior college tournament. The competition in the NAIA was weaker than on the average playground in New York, so Dennis dropped buckets like he was MJ, averaging 25 per game. However, it wasn't his scoring numbers that stood out, but his ferocious rebounding. Rodman led the division in rebounding with 16 in 1985 and 18 in 1986, which caught the eye of the Detroit Pistons, who took a chance on him with the 27th pick in the 1986 NBA Draft. Bad Boys for Life Rodman fit like a glove with the Pistons' blue-collar, hard-nosed roster led by Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, and Bill Lambeer. He was extremely loyal to the Pistons' head coach Chuck Daly and was willing to die for him on the court. Chuck was the father I didn't have. I did everything he said without questions. He was the only one who gave me a chance, and it was my duty to justify it every second on the floor. And Rodman did precisely that. Physically, he was a freak of nature, and he had so much energy that it seemed like he was powered by a nuclear power plant. There were many players who could stay out all night, drink, take a girl home, and then score 30 the next day because they were highly skilled. Will Chamberlain, Allen Iverson, Vince Carter, Barkley, and Jordan are examples of that, to name a few. But defense is something else. Defense takes willpower, a huge desire to stop the opponent, and energy to fight for position, and to jump higher than everybody for the rebound. And that's where Rodman was the best. He simply played harder than everybody else. He dove for loose balls, he rebounded harder than everybody, he never backed down on defense, not even an inch. And then he celebrated his good defense like a madman, and everybody hated playing against him. There was so much power and adrenaline in Rodman's body that he would often ride a stationary bike for another hour or lift weights after the games. With Rodman at the helm of their defense, the Pistons improved from 15th best defense in 1986 to 5th best defense in 1987 in Rodman's rookie year. In 1988, they had the second best defensive rating in the league and never dropped out of the top five during Rodman's time there. The Pistons had drafted Isaiah Thomas in 1981 and he was an all-star each season from 1982 until 1993. Bill Lambeer was also a three-time all-star in the mid-80s. Those two guys were the leaders of the team and its most famous players. But until Dennis Rodman came to the Pistons for the 86-87 season, Isaiah and Lambeer had only won one playoff series. And then, in 1987, they reached the conference finals and narrowly lost to the Celtics in Game 7. Finally, in 1988, they got past the Celtics, but the Lakers were too strong this time in the finals, and the Pistons fell in another Game 7, losing the championship by three points. But it all came together in 1989. The Pistons swept the Celtics and the Bucks, and then they got rid of Jordan and the Bulls in six games. In the finals, they swept the Lakers, avenging the loss from the year before and celebrating the first title in franchise history. 
Next season, Pistons dominated again and posted the best record in the East for the third consecutive season. They cruised to the conference finals when they met Jordan again. With the infamous Jordan rules, the Pistons literally beat the living crap out of MJ for an entire series, and they managed to defeat the Bulls in seven games. It was also the third consecutive season that the bad boy Pistons knocked Jordan out of the playoffs. In the 1990 Finals, Pistons edged Portland Trailblazers in five games, with Isaiah Thomas as the Finals MVP. In 1991, Jordan finally avenged all those losses, and his Bulls had swept the Pistons in the Conference Finals, after which the bad boys had famously left the building without shaking their hands. In 1992, the aging Pistons made it to the playoffs, but were eliminated in five games by the New York Knicks in the first round, which was the end of the bad boys era. Chuck Daly left the team, which was especially hard on Rodman. He didn't have a father figure anymore, and it was like somebody cut the leash off a wild animal. Tattoos started piling up, and Dennis the Menace became a regular in bars and nightclubs of downtown Detroit. Rodman even attempted to take his life in 1993, bringing a shotgun to the arena with the intent of using it on himself. Thankfully, he gave up and fell asleep in his car, where he was found by the legendary NBA reporter Craig Sager. Sager talked him out of suicide, but Rodman realized he couldn't stay in Motor City and demanded a trade. San Antonio Spurs and the best rebounder in the league Rodman came to the NBA at the age of 25. He was never interested in offense, and he averaged double figures in scoring only once in his career. He was on the floor because of his tenacious defense, as he was arguably the peskiest defender the league had ever seen, highlighted by two Defensive Player of the Year awards in 1990 and 1991. He was also always a strong rebounder for his size, and he averaged nine boards in 26 minutes per game during his first five seasons. Because he would always wiggle his way to the ball among taller players, he got nicknamed the Worm. However, what he did from 1992 to the rest of his career is almost inexplicable, and it shows what a unique basketball genius Dennis Rodman really was. He studied and practiced rebounding extensively and went to extreme lengths to check the angle and trajectory of the ball, learned how each player shoots, and adjusted his positioning accordingly. He learned how often the ball rotates with the best NBA scorers, which is how he knew where the ball would bounce if they missed. Combined with his supreme athleticism and everlasting cardio, this new technique created a rebounding machine. Rodman led the league in rebounding for seven seasons in a row between 1992 and 1998, averaging 16.7 boards in that span. When Rodman came to the Spurs in 93, he formed a killer defensive and rebounding duo with David Robinson. But the two stars never liked each other, and the team never reached the success it could. Robinson was in the Army. He lived a strict athlete lifestyle, while Rodman was getting more notorious by the minute. He started dyeing his hair every night with the Spurs, started getting more tats and piercings, and of course, he was drinking and partying as much as he could. However, the Spurs won 62 games in 1995, David Robinson was the MVP, and Rodman controlled the boards. But after they got defeated by Houston in the 95 playoffs, Rodman lashed out at coach Bob Hill, calling him a loser and blaming him for bad defensive strategy. After that public slander, among many other suspensions and misdemeanors, his days in San Antonio were numbered. Three-peat in Chicago In 1996, Rodman was at the height of his craziness. His book, Bad As I Wanna Be, just came out, and his rebellious phase had reached his peak. Signing Rodman to any team meant jeopardizing team chemistry, despite his rebounding titles and ferocious defense. However, Phil Jackson calculated that between Jordan's maniacal desire to win and his leadership skills, Rodman would not be able to disrupt team chemistry too much. And he was right. To this day, Phil claims that no one has picked up the principles of the triangle offense faster and better than Dennis Rodman. Jackson remarked that Rodman, despite all his uncontrollable behavior, wanted to be part of the team, but under his own conditions. He was always late for games. He didn't want to watch scouting reports in front of others. Afterward, he studied the report extensively while no one was around. He wanted to preserve the image of a rebel at all costs, but he didn't want to let the team down. Dennis famously never spoke to Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen outside the locker room in the court. He got drunk almost each and every day, poured around, escaped to Vegas in the middle of the season, and wrestled Hulk Hogan one day before the NBA Finals game. 
However, despite all the craziness, it all worked out. Phil was another father figure who he respected, and the same was with Jordan. The Bulls won three consecutive championships from 1996 to 1998, and they couldn't do it without the worm. In the 1996 finals against Seattle, Rodman had 11 offensive rebounds twice, which led to Seattle's coach Carl to say that Rodman won two games on his own. In the 97 and 98 finals, Rodman drove Carl Malone crazy with his defense, despite Malone weighing almost 50 pounds more than the worm. So if Rodman didn't come, MJ might have won another championship in his second stint with the Bulls, but he wouldn't have another three-peat without Rodman's defense and rebounding. I can guarantee you that. Legacy – Best Rebounder Ever After the Bulls, Rodman played for two more years for the Lakers and the Mavericks, but he played a total of 35 games in those two seasons. When he retired in 2000, he walked away as the greatest rebounder in NBA history. While Wilt and Bill Russell hold the most rebounding records, they played almost 48 minutes per game, while Rodman averaged 31 minutes per contest. They also played at a frenetic pace, so they had more opportunities for rebounds. And also, they were the tallest guys on the floor, while Rodman was a 6'7", lanky, small forward. Per 100 possessions, Rodman averaged more than 24 rebounds, which is more than Russell and Chamberlain. The highest career rebound percentage by a player is 23.4, by Dennis Rodman. The highest rebound percentage for one season is 29.7, also by Rodman. And the Worm owns seven of the top 10 rebound percentage seasons in NBA history. All of his seven rebounding titles came after his 30th birthday, and he could successfully guard Shaq in the post. And he did it all despite all the partying, alcohol, and women, which is beyond belief. The Worm was super intelligent as a basketball player, he played his heart out, and his teams won five NBA titles. He was also a trendsetter who made defense look cool and the first NBA player to get a lot of tattoos. Rodman left a big mark on the league, and he's deservedly in the Hall of Fame, despite scoring just seven points per game.